It's an amazing, humbling opportunity to be here uh, and to open God's word with you. Uh, there's nothing new I'm going to be saying today. Uh, may, it may be new to you, but it's, it's definitely no new truth. In fact, truth is rooted in the eternality of God. Uh, there is, so there is no new truth. Uh, but, and it's not new truth to FCF. It's the foundation of our message here every week. And my hope is to maybe just say the same thing in a different way, uh, in a different approach. And so here's my hope for us this morning, and it's really kind of, there's several hopes for us this morning, and um, I'm probably going to say, like, when, you know, this is the main point, and this is the main point. There's many main points, but um, uh, really, here's, here's a big overarching thing. Uh, it's to kind of expose us to the truth of who we are at our core, because that's, that's fundamental to the gospel. Uh, and then also, uh, who Jesus is, and, and in his beauty and his brilliance. And if we see, who our, if we see ourselves in our core who we are, then, then Jesus will become brilliant, and, and, and we'll see him as he, as he rightly is. And so our, our hope is that we would have sight, and maybe for the first time. Um, and so here's where we're going today. You are going to be commissioned, uh, each and every one of you, to go and to preach. Uh, you're, you're being commissioned to go and to preach. And it's going to start with preaching to yourself um, the gospel. And so we're going we're gonna to define that here in a minute. But uh, as we dive in, uh, I've said, I say this to my students a lot, and I, I say this uh, just kind of when I'm speaking. Uh, you know, I have to pick an empty seat and, and put myself there. Um, uh, and any empty seat is uh, for me because what I'm telling you the Word says to do, I struggle to do it. Um, in fact, I bomb at doing it. Anytime a preacher or teacher opens the Word, I think they have to focus on an empty seat. And let their audience know that that's my seat, that's where I'm sitting, uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, I used to think that effective preaching and teaching uh, was done from a point of arriving, and the only thing that produced was self-righteousness, uh, fear, and pride. And uh, So I've been more encouraged in my walk with Jesus by the preacher, teacher who knows he has a call from God on his life, but is keenly aware he has no uh, right to preach the word apart from the grace of God. And he gets that, uh, he doesn't do what the word is calling him or God's people to do, and, and I'm not suggesting that, uh, that this you know, the preacher teacher doesn't uh, want to do what God's word says. He just, he, he realizes first and foremost, he struggles to do. It. And so the message that he, he speaks from is, is first and foremost to himself and then, and then to the people. So uh, I get that. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and go to John chapter 15. I'm just going to kind of map this out for us. That's where we're going to spend predominantly most of our time, John 15. And then we're going to kind of bolster it with uh, a little bit in Colossians 2. But we're going to go verse by verse, John 15, 1 through 11. So at some point you start freaking out because 10 minutes have passed and I'm still in verse 2. Relax, we'll get there. Um, uh, I kind of want to start us all by kind of just giving us a quick landscape of, of our culture. And uh, if you've been here any point in time, you've heard Pastor Dave and others here talk about this. Our culture here is it's a weird animal, Western Maryland. Uh, we're hyper-religious, and that's not a compliment. Um, we have, I forget the numbers, 300 churches and 8 to 10 square miles. And, and the problem with that is, is that uh, just by and large what we see, I would suggest probably a lot of those churches aren't gospel preaching churches. And, and now granted, I haven't sat in, hardly, in most of them, but the gospel produces something. And, and, and if it's producing what the Bible says it should be, then there should be a radical difference and so uh, I'm, I'm you know, speaking aware of, of where we're at, and um, I'm hoping that, that uh, we can kind of perk up to that today and think about where we're at in that. Um, I, I have a friend who's allowed me to kind of uh, share his story. In fact, it's really gracious of him. I'm not going to hopefully not share his name. Uh, I don't want to slip, but um, he's, he's allowed me to share his story. He's a guy, when my wife and I, I'm from the area. I was born and raised, uh, but I uh, went to Word of Life Bible Institute, which is where I met my wife, and um, she's really hot. And we met, and um, uh, I had to convince her uh, that I was hot too, at least for her. That took a while. I'd, some call it stalking. I, um, I call it persistence. But anyway, I persistently followed her around until she finally uh, liked me enough to say she loved me, and then she married me. So praise God. Um, but anyway, we, we met in uh, upstate New York, moved back to Indiana, which is where she's from. And uh, we lived there for four and a half, five years. And then we came back here in 2010, just kind of felt God was calling us. Real sketchy and scary. I mean, it's never sketchy and scary when God's doing the calling, but on our end, it kind of is at times, and you, many of you can relate to that. And so God called us uh, back to this area, and um, uh, I got a job uh, selling cars for a while, and, and uh, that's a shady business. And if any of you should sell cars, I'm, I'm sure you, hopefully you're doing it le legit, and I tried to be legit, but it was, it was difficult. But I met a guy who was a, who's a believer, and, and we became friends, and we just used to have really, really good talks. I mean, we had like some really deep conversations, a lot of spiritual conversations. Um, 
and just being real. And I, and I love that about, about him. And, and, uh, um, but a couple years ago, he had a uh, pretty significant moral failing, and, uh, which resulted in a, 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 a broken marriage, and uh, among other things. And um, uh, we, we initially kind of had some good conversations about everything regarding that and, and just kind of what's God doing and, and man, you know, calling him back to truth. And, and uh, he's, he was on board with that for a while, but then eventually um, he uh, it just kind of fell apart. And for about two years, he went off the grid. And so I would send text messages. I'd call him, I'd leave messages, and, and I, never would, I never heard from him. And so, you know, from time to time, I think about him and I pray for him. And, and I, I never wanted to beat him up. I wasn't calling him or texting him to yell at him. I was calling to tell him that, man, there's grace for you. And that's the message of the gospel. Uh, but uh, he just kind of, um, as he says now, he just kind of spiraled out in self-loathing, hatred, and the things that come with, with uh, sin that's not seen in the light of the gospel. And um, uh, about a month and a half ago, I, I, as I said, I'm a teacher, and, and I do what I shouldn't. I keep my phone on me sometimes. Now, Good reason is, is my wife, we had a baby, my wife had a baby, I did not have a baby. Uh, I was at an arm's length uh, in, that, in that special room, <laughs> and uh, at one point in, in, the deli- in the delivery, she just looked at me, and was like, would you shut up? And I was like, oh man. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was scary, but uh, that was our second child. Um, but anyway, I was keeping my phone on me for a while, I was out of habit, because you know, I wanted to know if she was going in labor, and, and that's a good thing. And so, uh, but so sometimes I would keep my phone on me, but this was after the fact, and, and I got this text message, and I checked, and it was towards the end of a class, and it said, hey, this is, and this, this individual's name, and, uh, and then he, he said, hey, um, is, this, is this Aaron? And I responded back, I was like, is this, you know, who I think it is? And he said, yes, and, and so I said, hey, man, yeah, let's, let, so we traded text just for a couple minutes, I was like, oh, by the way, I'm teaching, I should probably stop this. Um, so I said, let me call you a little later, so I have some afternoon time on my, my weekly days, which is good for me to prep and, and do some studying and things, and, and so um, during that time, I, I got a chance to talk. We talked for 45, 45, 60 minutes, and really great conversation, and, and what you could hear in his voice was repentance. I mean, this guy was, uh, God was clearly uh, working in him, clearly uh, drawing him back to himself, clearly drawing him away from sin. And, um, and so that was really, really cool to be a part of. But we ended up meeting later that week, and so we got to sit down in front of each other. Um, I, just before that, Pastor David asked me if I would preach on today, and I said, sure. Um, and so I was thinking about what am I going to talk about. So I was kind of up in the air. Uh, I was kind of really thinking about talking about something else that I'm really passionate about because it's something that God's really just revealing to me that I stink at. And, uh, and so he's kind of leading me through that. And uh, but, so I was going kind of leaning that way. And then we sat down and had this conversation. And we, he made a statement in our conversation that left me saying, nope, here's where we're going. And, um, and we're about to get into that. But he, he made a statement of basically how before, and this was years and years, he would, he would spend time in the Word. He would, he would try to be in the Word of God. But it would kind of be this really bad rhythm where it was, it would, he'd lose steam. Um, there was no sustenance because he was doing it from obligation versus acceptance. We're going to talk about those two words this morning, obligation and acceptance. And it was more of like a, I should be doing this, therefore that's why he did it. And, and uh, that's not the way we want to be in the Word. Now, from time to time, we're going to be like that, and, and that's real. But that's not, that shouldn't be like the rhythm of our lives. And so today, we're really going to be fighting and talking about like how do we not do that. And so um, uh, more on that in, in a bit. But uh, one of the things I tell my students, I'm just going to say it here, is, is uh, I often tell them it would, sometimes it would be, I think it would be way safer for them spiritually to grow up in a dangerous inner city than in, in Western Maryland because here we're drunk on religion. Um, and the stories of the Bible, but a lot of times there's no real relationship with Jesus. And, um, you know, they hear, speaking to them, but this, you know, plug yourself into this. They hear, you hear, you know, from your parents, youth pastor, myself, chapel, Bible, class, and of course they're in that class. And, uh, and if, they're, if they're not careful, and if we're not careful, um, then we will know all about Jesus, but miss him in, entirely. And so and you're no different, and I'm no different. We, we can be this close to Jesus, but miss him for eternity because of head. You know, we, we know stuff, and we can repeat facts, and we can... Tell somebody, you know, that we, we can even repeat the gospel but not yet know the gospel. And so um, identity is a key word today. One of the key words. I said there's going to be several. Identity is a key word today. Um, and so in using words like obedience and acceptance, uh, there's a major danger if we get this wrong. And so if you are taking notes, um, uh, if not, just maybe burn this in your brain. Uh, if you were to write down the word obedience with an arrow beside it to the word acceptance, that's often how we tend to try to live our Christian lives. Uh, we, try to tend, we tend to live our Christian lives with the idea that if I obey, then I will be accepted. 
And uh, that's not the gospel at all. But yet it, it, it has the appearance of being gospel, and it's not. And so if we're, if we're not careful, we can fall into that, and that's, that's super dangerous. Um, and so um, I think first off, just briefly, I just need to define the gospel because we can't take that for granted. I think that's a word we assume a lot of times. We assume the gospel, meaning we assume we know the gospel or that others know the gospel. And we start in talking about the gospel, and uh, if we're not careful, we can assume it, and, and it's, we need to start there. So uh, what is the gospel? The gospel is, uh, the, the, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. Uh, but but there, uh, also, I think throughout reading the scriptures, you, we, could, we could say the life of Christ as well. And um, Jesus said, you know, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. That means he had to, he had to live it out. He had to obey the law in our stay. He didn't just come as, a, as an adult and, and you, know, you know, go to the cross, die, raise again, which would have been fantastic. But uh, the whole problem of our lives not measuring up to God's standard, that's a huge problem. So, so Christ had to live that life in our place. And so we often miss that, and today's really, we're going to kind of focus on the life of Christ as well as those other aspects is also. So uh, another key word today, so we've got identity, that's a key word, uh, key words acceptance and obedience, but also we want to talk about this word abide. Now abide's a great word, uh, and here's, here's some of the meanings uh, or some uh, synonyms. We could also say continue, to endure, to remain, or to stay. And, and I've also added uh, to persevere, because that's a key in the Christian life. Uh, the Christian life is one of perseverance, continuance. It's not a once upon a time, pray to prayer through a stick and a fire, um, something like that. It, it's, a, it's a continual thing. Yes, it happens in a point of time, but that point of time is also continued out until one day we're face to face with, with Jesus. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into John 15, 1. Um, we're going to kind of do a little bit of verse by verse, as I said. And uh, verse 1 in John 15 says, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is you know, relatively right, I mean, right before he's getting ready to go to the cross. Uh, so he's saying some really tender words uh, to his disciples. And um, this is what he starts with in 15. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So John Calvin says, The nature of man is unfruitful and destitute of every good, because no man has the nature of a vine till he be implanted in him. And I'm going to say that again. The nature of man is unfruitful and destitute of everything good, because no man has the nature of a vine till he be implanted in him. So we don't have vine options. So it's not like, well, Jesus is a good vine option, or you know, this religious system is a good vine option, or maybe no religious system, which I would argue is a religious system, but that, something else, uh, is a good vine option. And so it, that's, not, that's not what this lends itself to at all. It's, there's one vine, and you're either in the vine or you're not, and if you're not, you're dead. Okay? And so the idea here is that we toil but find no rest, uh, nor can we, because the only true rest comes from being planted in the true vine. And so, practical question, how about you? Where do you seek to find rest? If it's not in Jesus Christ, how's that working out for you? Have you come to the place of endless toil and restlessness, where nothing is seeming to work and no rest is found? Which, if you're here today and that's you, and this is all kind of new to you, and you're like, that's me, that is a gift of grace in and of itself. God has allowed you, he's brought you to this place where you would feel restless, where you would feel toil and just sapped of strength, and, and it's to bring you to his perfect son, Jesus. And so maybe that's you for the first time. Maybe you're here and you are a believer, and you're, you're man, like, I do feel that. I feel toilsome. I feel like I need rest. Well, again, that's, that's all what we're about today in this idea of abiding and we're going to keep on hatching that. So uh, verse 2 says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the issue here isn't that can someone truly be in the vine and then be removed. Don't read it that way because uh, what we do with the Bible is a, is a great way to, to read the Bible and understand the Bible. is called systematically. It's systematic theology. Uh, means we translate or, or we look at one verse in light of all of Scripture. Uh, really dangerous things have happened uh, through about time, uh, and look at American uh, uh, Christianity, and over the last hundred years, some dangerous things have happened over doing this, taking a verse and building a whole doctrine of theology out of it, instead of interpreting it against the rest of Scripture. 
So don't do that with this. Let's, let's fight to see what he's trying to say. So um, the, the issue isn't that someone can truly be in the vine and then be removed. The rest of Scripture clearly tells us no, an emphatic no. You can't be in and then out if you're in. So what seems to be happening here is a mere, out, mere outward profession, people who would identify with Christ by profession only. So what they are lacking is a real relationship. See, God is not interested in your religion or your man-made attempts at righteousness. In this case, in these people that appear to be in, but they're really not, there has never been a transfer of trust. There's never been abiding, gospel abiding. The true believer, however, will undergo constant pruning. God will continually work in the believer's life to take away that which is not of him, and this is a process. So here's a practical question. Are you being pruned are you being pruned? And, and do you know where you're being pruned? I think these are good things to wrestle through. If God says we're going to be pruned, I think it's good to know uh, by the Spirit of God and, and by asking. And, and if you're like, I don't really know, well, if you're a believer, then ask. Make that a point of prayer. God, show me what you're trying to do. If you're a believer and you're in tune with the Spirit and step with the Spirit, you probably are having a pretty good idea of where God's trying to work on you right now. And all of us, God is trying to work on us right now because, a little secret, we haven't arrived. For me, I'm going to go into this a little bit of detail later. I like to use personal examples, but um, as a husband and father right now, I'm getting nailed. I mean, he's lighting me up. So I'm going to give a couple examples of that in a bit. But let's go to 15.3, and then we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Uh, 3 says this, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already you're clean. Now this is beautiful. Don't miss this. Tune into what this, is, what this is telling us. So Jesus reminds his disciples that they're already clean because of the word spoken to them. So he spoke, they believed. So prune uh, in, in scripture here, it, it often can mean to clean. So when Jesus says you are clean, this appears to be showing this idea of justification. So justification means I am justified with God. I've been made right, not by any merit or work of my own, but only because of what Christ has done in my place. But then there's this idea of being pruned so I'm being cleaned, which is sanctification, right? So you are clean, you're justified, but you will also be cleaned, you're being sanctified. Or you will be pruned, you are being sanctified. So this idea of knowing where you're being pruned, knowing where God is, is pinpointing on your life and working in that uncomfortable place of, of just taking things away from you for your good and his glory is actually a beautiful thing to know again because it gives us hope. Like, wow, God's pruning me, I must be his. That's awesome. And we, should, we should find hope in that. So, but let's find hope in, in who Jesus is saying this to. Who's he talking to? His disciples. And think about where these guys are at. Their faith is far from complete or perfect. In just a bit, they're going to leave him. One's going to completely deny him. They all abandon him. And yet he says they're already clean. This is so backwards from the way we often view our relationship with God. Here's what we do. If, if I perform or try harder, then I will be clean. It's this perpetual uh, cycle, this, this perpetual performance wheel. But no, we are clean, therefore we get to obey. Because we're clean, we can obey. So I can't stress the importance of the word of God in the process of pruning. Um, we don't love the Bible so that we'll be saved. We love the Bible because we have been saved. Okay? We don't do the Bible so God will like us more or so we can put God in our debt. Our debt has been paid, therefore we can follow and obey. We're free. And there's much more of that to come. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. He says this. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is inviting. He's saying, come, abide in me. Find your rest in me. And so are you resting in Jesus? Well, you can today, maybe even for the first time. You've, you've, you've never transferred that trust. You've never put your hope in Christ. Well, today, can, you can do that. That's extended to you. Jesus is saying to you, come, find rest. Think of Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest. That's a promise. You can take Jesus at his word. And then he says some really crazy things that really kind of this great against our flesh, the greats against our, our sinful nature, does mine. I don't like to be told I can't do anything. I don't know about you. Uh, maybe, maybe you're just super humble and I want to punch you in the throat. 
um, because I'm arrogant and I don't like to be told I can't do anything. So, when, but when Jesus, uh, this has actually come to be just such a, a bedrock of rest for me because Jesus is outing us at this point. Get this, like you, you're talking about performance. I don't have to perform. I don't have to be better. Jesus is outing us right here. He says, you can't do anything apart from me. He doesn't say most of this is hard, but you can muster up enough strength on your own. I'm just here to help. No, apart from him, we can do nothing. And so one of the things I said I want to do today is reveal us at our core. And when we reveal ourselves and when our core is revealed, then Jesus becomes beautiful and brilliant. And so this idea of a, apart from him, we can do nothing. Here's a practical question for you. And if I'll ask it and then I'll give you instructions. Who is the worst sinner you know? Don't point fingers. Don't look to your spouse or your kids or your parents. Just think. Okay? If you're smart, eyes straight ahead, you'll think. Okay? Tendency is to look to the right and nudge somebody. Don't do that. But who is the worst sinner you know? That tells a lot about us how we answer that question. Our tendency probably is to be, uh, think about the person that, man, maybe today you drove here and you looked at somebody who was doing something other than going to church. Man, they're the worst sinner you know. How dare they? Maybe it is your spouse. Maybe you're like, man, they are. Okay, they're a piece of work. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe that's who you think. Maybe, maybe it's your, your kids' friends and their parents. Because surely you would never do the things that they do, the things they let their kids do. Maybe, maybe it's that person in your, in your vicinity who, who goes to church, man, and they, they would call themselves a Christian, but, but how dare they? Because they gossip, and you would never do that. Yet you sit on the, on the outside looking and judging critically. It's such a wicked sin we do as Christians. We gossip, but we also judge critically. And I think God would definitely call us to repent of that. The, the point is this. Here's what I want you to get. You're the worst sinner you know. And I'm the worst sinner I know. That's the way it has to be. Because if not, then what Jesus says here, apart from me, you can do nothing. Eh, we'll take it or leave it. But if we get that, like if we really start to get that, when he says you can't do anything. And now, I'm not saying you can't do something nice for somebody. I often think of, uh, Pastor Dave has given this example a couple times, um, uh, of when he lived down in, in the Bowie area, and you know, he was still a young adult pastor, and of how it was really a bad winter, and he and his, his uh, kind Muslim neighbor were taking cookies and hot chocolate to the snowplow guy. I don't know if you remember that story, but it's really good, because he, he, was, getting, he was getting outdone by the, the, the Muslim guy. And by the way, the Muslim guy was a really nice guy. He wasn't, like, he wasn't being a jerk. He was, he was trying to be kind, but... If we're looking at their belief system, then they were done from two totally different, um, two totally different starting points and ending points. See, you can do good things, but if they're not done in light of the gospel and what Christ has done for you, then they're filthy rags. The, the God says that. And that should hold weight on us. Maybe you're here and you're like, you're trying to make this defense. Well, God, I do these things and I'm pretty good. I've done this. But here's the thing. If it's not done in light of the gospel, it's filthiness. It's disgusting to a holy God. And this should weigh on us. Apart from him, we can do nothing. There's good news. Don't worry, we're going there. Verse 6, he says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So again, Jesus is talking here about those who would appear to be his. For a season they appear to bear fruit, but they don't persevere. Okay? So what causes this appearance? A, a couple things can come into play, but ultimately it comes down to the person never truly resting in Jesus. Uh, they never are his because they never abided to begin with. They did, but never rested. Think about Jesus' uh, fatal words in Matthew 7 uh, to, to those who would stand before him, and, and he says, get away from me. I never knew you. And they, they start rattling off all these things, and to us, it, it causes fear because we relate to these people who are saying these things because they're telling them things they did. But the problem is, is they never knew him, and he never knew them. They never found rest in him. They did stuff for him, which really is ultimately building up ourselves. Instead of saying, again, apart from you, I can do nothing. A true believer will always persevere because they are abiding. 
And that's what this sermon is all about. It's, as believers, we have to continually be reminded of our identity and where we need to abide. An unbeliever will eventually tire of the message or give up altogether and move on to something else. And so, seven then, he talks about this idea of asking and praying. And, and um, he's, so my question is, what do you desire? Uh, th- this verse has some keys to successful praying. And, and really, you could build a whole I mean, message out of just this verse alone, but um, we're kind of coming through it to get to the end. Uh, so, uh, namely, um, some keys to su- successful praying are abiding in him and his word, abiding in us by faith. Uh, when you pray, are you praying from a heart that's been renewed? Are you praying from changed desires? It's, it's interesting listening to prayer requests from kids. Um, you know, they, and, and it's just funny. I mean, I don't laugh at them. I've learned not to. Um, but, like, you know, they're, they're praying for things that, um, you know, are super important to them. And, and that is, it's, it's good. Like, it's good that they're praying for those things. But to us, we may be like, really, you're going to pray for that, you know? And, and, but yet, we do the same thing. We just do it in a more civilized manner. We, we spiritualize it, you know? But are we praying from changed desires? Is that, our desi- is that what we're doing? Do our desires come from a new heart that is lining up with Christ and his desires? So what Jesus is saying is not a blanket statement. This isn't prosperity gospel. Okay, ask and you'll get it. Okay, I was saying in the first service, I want a motorcycle. Pastor Kyle has definitely helped me want, to mo- want a motorcycle, to want a motorcycle. But the problem is there's all kinds of problems with me having a motorcycle. First of all, I've never even... <laughs> I've never even uh, driven one, so it would be bad. Um, secondly, I don't have money uh, <laughs> for that. Um, and we could go on and on and on. But so if I take this verse and say, all right, God, I want a motorcycle. Come on, come on. Uh, ain't going to happen. Okay? Because my desires aren't lined up with, they're not lined up with his. That's the whole point of what Jesus is saying. If you've been renewed, if you've been abiding with me, then you will have a new heart. You will have changed desires. And you will then ask according to my will. And then because of that, you will then get what you ask for. You will receive what you've been asked for because God is a good dad. This isn't prosperity theology. God's not a genie. And I think some of us actually probably need to repent of that today. We probably think God's our genie. I do. I do. Oftentimes. Verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So God's people bear fruit. Christians do something and it's bearing fruit. But the problem again is is we see that bearing fruit and we go try and do, but we don't miss the first part, which is the word spoken to the Christian, which is you are clean. You can now abide in that. Now you can go and do. And then verse 9 As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Now, don't miss this. This is something I think probably all of us, most of us, would would say we struggle with. That's the love of God. So don't miss what Christ is saying. He's telling his disciples, and that includes us today if we are in Christ, that the same love the Father has for the Son, the Father has for us. I don't know if you've thought about that before. I hope you have, and I hope it causes you to think about it today. That the same love that the Father has for the Son, He now has, He has for those who are in Christ. So do you get this? Like, think about this. Do you often feel as though your Heavenly Father is merely putting up with you? Is He waiting for you to get it together? Does He just kind of like you until, like, glory, and then He's going to kind of love you a little more because you're surely better than you are now? I want you to think about this. Do you, do you realize that you are as loved now as you ever will be by the Father? You're as loved today as you ever will be by God the Father. Because it's not based on your performance. It's not based on how well you perform this week. It's not based on uh, what you are or aren't wrestling with right now. It's based upon the person and work of Jesus It's based upon the gospel, the good news. This shreds the performance argument and allows us to come boldly before our Father, for we are seen as complete because of Christ. Yet we know we feel far from complete. Positionally, we are complete. So this is the idea that when God saves someone, they are positionally complete. Like God is looking at them, sees the righteousness of Jesus. That's, again, what we have to keep coming back to. We have to keep abiding in that, which then, as practically we live that out, then 
that actually starts to change how we live because we're obeying out of this idea that I'm already accepted. I'm already in. God loves me. I'm complete. And it's not because of me. It's because Christ has made me a son or a daughter of the living God. And out of that, now I can go. I can live. I can respond. So we need to hear this and meditate on it. The same love the Father has for the Son is given to us in Christ. And then what does Jesus say? He says, abide in my love. And so this means enjoy it. Savor it. Rest in it. So here's a major point we can't miss. You and I don't have the ability to perfectly abide in this love. So Jesus says, abide. But you don't have the ability to do that. So what do we do with that? Well, this isn't a point of despair. Rather, it's an invitation to ask God for the help we need to abide, to rest, to savor. That's the Holy Spirit. He's given us his spirit. And we need to tap into that. So we must ask Jesus to confirm this love within us. Okay, it's interesting that the part of abiding has to do with obedience. And let's look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So if we're not careful, this can actually just blow us up a bit and, and really kind of lead to a little bit of despair because he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So what we tend to think about that is that if I am obeying, then God will love me. If I'm not, then I'm not in his love. Well, let's, let's look at that. Let's think about this first. Um, if God is good and all his commands are good, then wouldn't it make sense for him to save us to good works? So don't misunderstand. We, we're not saved by works of our own. In fact, we have to come to that place, John 15, 5, where we can do nothing. We get that, and we have no good thing apart from him. But God loves us so much that when he saves us, he does the work through his spirit to spur us on to obedience because obedience is what's best for us. Obedience is what's best for you and me. Think about Philippians 1.6. Uh, he's faithful to complete what he began. So the work that he began. Well, what is the work? Well, Ephesians, Ephesians 1.4 says, We've been chosen to be holy and blameless, but we will never will ourselves to this obedience. It's all God. He enables us through the Holy Spirit to be obedient. As we rest in, it is finished. We are free to follow, fail, and follow. And we will fail. You have permission today to fail. Because you will. But we will also follow. For we have been born again, and new life seeks new things, the things of God. So here's, here's what John Calvin says about this verse. He says, For the obedience which believers render to him is not the cause why he continues his love toward us. So God doesn't love us continually because we're being obedient but is rather the effect of his love. So the reason we're obedient is because he loves us. We're being obedient because we have been saved and we are being saved and it's producing in us obedience, but that obedience is never going to be perfect. And, and I think a lot of us have to kind of just take a breath. I do, man. I'm, I'm really, really ultra hard on myself. I beat myself up all the time and I, I'm sure you do too. And this is the rest of his quote. He says, for whence comes it that they answer to their calling, but because they are led by the spirit of adoption of free grace. This, this driving for obedience, what's, what's the, what is the driving for obedience in you? Is it, is it led by the spirit of God, or is it led in this, this toilsome, restless state of, I've got to perform, I've got to be better, I've got to try harder? So let's make this practical. Um, I use myself as an example. Uh, I, I said this earlier. Um, I feel the weight of being a godly husband and father, okay, as I should. I fail continually. It's true. Um, and it's probably shocking to you. Uh, I just told my wife yesterday, so this is a little personal story. Uh, yesterday, we were, uh, my wife likes Whole Foods, and that's in uh, uh, Gaithersburg. We don't, we're not uh, super hip up here yet. We haven't gotten one. Uh, but maybe we could start a petition or something after the service. But Whole Foods is good. It's good food. Um, and so we, uh, we went down there, and uh, we had a gift card. Uh, so we were going to use it. And um, I, I told her this in the car. I said, it's never my intent to just do whatever I feel like and then just ask her for forgiveness. So it's kind of like that religious view of God we sometimes have. This was, this was my view in college. Um, I would just like do whatever I wanted and then just ask God for forgiveness with no real heart change. I would just, you know, hey, God, forgive me for this weekend. It's going to be crazy. And uh, that, was, that, was, that was it. I'd read my Bible like 
one eyed open because I'd been out drinking. And I mean, it was just, it, it wasn't, it, it was religion. It was saying, all right, I can, I'll tack this on to what I just did to make myself feel better. And so I wanted her to know, like, look, when I ask for your forgiveness, I'm not just doing whatever just to do it because I know you'll forgive me because you have to, because you love Jesus. <laughs> um, but we were driving, and uh, uh, we were getting off the exit uh, to Gaithersburg to go, and um, I, uh, I was waiting on her directions. So first of all, there, there should be like a major ding go off in our heads when I say I was driving, and my wife was beside me, and I'm waiting on directions. Um, and it's not her fault, because she was, she was looking at the directions, but she was kind of like, we were trying to figure out which way we're going uh, off the exit, you know, and so um, I was told to go one way, and then it was, wait, we might be supposed to be going back that way, and so inside, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Like, it's kind of thick down here, a lot of traffic, Gaithersburg, uh, I'd kind of like to know which way I'm going, and so, uh, no, 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 I think we're supposed to go this way, okay, okay, so we're, right, but inside, I was starting to like kind of get frustrated, and, and I responded, uh, I responded rather shortly, and, uh, and that's when I had to say, babe, I'm sorry, I, I just need your forgiveness again, because I'm really not trying to do this, but see, my point is this, I fail, man, I fail at being a good, godly husband, I fail at being a good, godly father. My son is a toddler. That should say it all. God is teaching me more really about his patience for me um, in these moments, I think, because I, I see how quick I lose it with Elias. Um, I, and I lose it pretty quick inside. Now, it's not outside. I can pretend like I'm being a pretty good dad, but inside, I'm just, I'm not thinking good things, man. They are not sanctified thoughts. And, uh, and so the battle is, is to, to, to kill that, put that to death by the Spirit, and, and to let that respond outwardly. But what God has really shown me is, is that you can't even keep it together when your toddler, who is a toddler, can barely do something. And you can't keep it together. And look at me and my eternal patience with you. You know? And I'm, so that, just, that alone just kind of mind-boggling to me. But the point, is, the point of all that is this. Um, when I'm selfish, when I'm arrogant, when I respond shortly, my, the Heavenly Father looks at me as spotless, as pure, and as clean. Not because of my actions, but because Jesus always loved his bride perfectly. So when I failed to love my wife perfectly, Jesus never failed to love his bride perfectly. He was, he was and is never selfish. He was never short. He was never arrogant. And that's the very truth that spurs us on to obedience. If we have been saved by, God, by such a God as this, how can we not pursue obedience because it's beautiful? Like, if God is that good that he would save us to spite us and then call us to obedience, how can we not obey? How can we not obey out of a, a renewed heart, out, of, out, of, out of, of, of purity because of what he's done for us? And so that's just a glimpse of what it means to, like, to look at the gospel in, in our lives in relation to our, our different relationships. And, and so I want you to kind of maybe become, become familiar with, with this. Uh, you're free to follow, fail, and follow. You're free to follow, fail, and follow. He knows you're going to fail. It was despite you, he saved you. You're free to pursue obedience. Verse 11, he says this, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. See, God's more, far more radical than we think. Uh, we perceive God as often just waiting to mess up, and then, like, bam, he's going to get us. Uh, he's actually after our joy. Uh, and where do we find it? Only in Christ and only as we obey because he has so woven this tapestry of joy and obedience together that you can't have one without the other. Like, you're not going to say, I'm going to be obedient, but then I don't have joy. And you're not going to be like, I want the joy of God. I'm going to have joy, but I'm not being obedient. He's put them together. This is divine. This is beautiful. This is this, this tapestry, this work of art that he's done. So God has orchestrated obedience to be a part of abiding love. And it's his redemption plan. In his redemption plan, gospel obedience is a major way we abide. So we're talking about this idea of abide. But like, you know, how, how do we do that? Well, well one way is, is gospel obedience. I, I started off kind of saying one of the, one of the issues we have is, is we often operate out of obedience leading us to acceptance. And, and I said that's wrong. We've got to flip that. So what we actually have to do is we have to really operate out of acceptance. I'm accepted in Christ. Therefore, that does lead to my obedience now. This is key, but we get this wrong so, so often. Uh, we're continually confronted by sin, so we need to be continually confronted by the gospel. 
And so this is what you're being commissioned with today, to go and preach the gospel to yourself and then to others. And so here's some practical ways. And as we, as we do this, we look at our first point. We're going we're gonna to flip over to uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to hit verse 6 and then just hit a couple of these verses. This passage alone is phenomenal, and I'm not doing any justice to it in the sense of really digging in uh, to find all the stuff, but I'm using it to kind of bolster the, this main idea of, of, uh, of application for point one. So there's kind of five things I want to say, one of which is this. You need and I need to preach the gospel to ourselves. Okay, that's what I've been saying. You need to preach the gospel to yourself. And to, I need to preach it to myself. We have to know what was done for us so that we abide with confidence. We have to know how it was done for us so that we can abide with thankfulness. Okay, we want to abide with confidence and we want to abide with thankfulness. Look at verse 6 in Colossians 2. It says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So we receive Christ by faith. How did we receive Christ the Lord? By faith. Okay? And Paul encourages us to walk in him as we've received him by this faith. And it's knowing who Jesus is. It's, it's proclaiming him as Lord first to ourselves and believing that and then to those around us. And so we have to stay in that. We don't ever get away from the same faith that saves us because that, that, that faith that saves us is the same faith that spurs us on to obedience and that it spurs us on in sanctification that one day will deliver us into glory. So we have to stay in Christ with faith every day. We don't move past the God. You don't move past this. I want to jump down to verse 11. He says this. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, we're not going to talk about that word circumcision. Um, ask a friend if you're not clear. Um, but we're not talking in this instance necessarily about the physical act of circumcision, although he is using it to paint this picture. Uh, it's talking about a spiritual picture of what has happened to the believer. Okay, so Paul tells us that we've been transferred from the body of flesh that is in Adam or in, in sin, okay, and we've now become one with Christ and thus now we're in Christ and have righteousness. Remember, it's imputed, means it's been given to us freely and it's, it's God's work on our behalf. So uh, he's saying you now have been made this spiritual being, you were dead, now you're alive, okay. So we're, again, we're looking for reasons to be confident in this. Verse 12, he says... Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Man, you need to underline that word all. And if, if you're a believer, you need to write around that word us, circle it and put your name. All. All having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Think about what God has done for you in Christ. God has made you alive. We were dead. God makes us alive. Who did the work here? God. You were passive. He is active. So not only did he make you alive, he also canceled this thing looming over our, your head and my head, which is our sin debt. The Bible says the wages of sin, what we have earned for sin is death. We've all been in open, glad rebellion to God from day one, right? But what God has done in Christ is he has pursued you, he has loved you, he has made you alive, and now you can respond by faith to the gospel, and not only that, now is, is that you're alive, but you have now had this record of debt canceled. Why should we not be confident? And why should we not be thankful? We should be the most confident and thankful people out there. And, and, and by the way, confident is not arrogant. Okay, confident, it's not confidence in us, it's confident in Christ. It's, it's a humble confidence. This was all God. So, Preaching the gospel to ourselves. We need to be confident in what he's done, and we need to also be thankful for what he's done. So preaching the gospel to self. Number two, application. I, I want, we need to become gospel-y, or gospel I just made up a word. Uh, gospel fluent. We need to be fluent in the gospel. There's a better way to do it. 
uh, ask yourself, how does the gospel speak into me being a better husband, father, or wife, mother? How does the gospel impact me as a son or daughter? How does the gospel impact me as an employee or student? See, the gospel is holistic. It's not a compartment. Our spiritual life isn't compartmentalized. That's what we do a lot of times. It, it infiltrates every area of our lives. It has something to say about everything we do. The gospel is holistic. It's beautiful. If, if it was just this thing where I get to you know, one day be with God, that's amazing. I'm not knocking that because that's awesome. But here's the thing. It, it's so much more than that. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is at hand and he's invited us to play. We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of the renewal of all things. The gospel is holistic, so we got to become experts in seeing how does it impact my life in every area. So I'm preaching it to myself. I'm becoming gospel fluent. I've got, yeah, there I did it again. I'm becoming fluent in the gospel. And then number three, we need to fight to believe that obedience is meant to lead to your joy and to my joy. We've got to fight to believe that. You're not going to just wake up feeling, okay, today's great. I feel like just obeying everything God says, and I don't fight against that at all. That's not real life. You may be dead at that point. And you're in heaven, so that's a good thing. But if, if you're still alive and you've woken up, and that's, there's, a, there's a wrestling match going on here. So we gotta, we gotta fight for this. We gotta fight to believe that obedience is meant to lead to joy. We gotta study who God is. A, a great book for me on this was Desiring God by John Piper. I commend it to all of you. It's a thick book, uh, not only in, in pages, but also in thought. You have to think through this, but it's good. Chew on it. Fight to see that obeying God is a th something we do from a joy because our hearts have been, we've been born again. We have new hearts that now beat. God has put and written his law on our hearts. We need to fight for that gospel joy and obey, obedience. If you're not obeying well, you're not abiding well. Do you believe God is actually a good dad who knows what he's talking about? If he has bought you with the greatest price, think about that, he's bought you with the greatest price, could it not be that his commands are meant to lead you to greater joy? And I think, man, honestly, I think there's probably a lot of repentance that needs, needs to happen because if we are honest, and not, so we stop playing church, but we get honest, we'll, we, we would actually probably confess that we don't really see God's uh, commands as joyful. And I think we just got to be honest about that. God, I mean, remember, you're already accepted. You don't have to pretend. What if we just got before God and said, God, I got to be honest. I'm, I'm really struggling to obey out of a heart of joy. Would you help me? That could be one of the most healing things you do for yourself. Because you're already accepted. You're in Christ. What more do you have to prove? It's already been proven. He's sufficient. Number four, we need to read the word from an already accepted view. And we need to pray in that way. Spend time asking God to show you how he has already accomplished everything for you in Christ. Read the Bible through this lens. You're already accepted. Ask God to make the gospel come alive to you and to help you believe deeply. Uh, one of the biggest, I think, I don't know, misconceptions is, is this idea that, at least for me, maybe these are the things I wrestle with that nobody else does, but I, I, don't, I think we do, um, is this idea that my faith, you know, would be better if, or if I believed more. And, and, and so here's the thing. God, first of all, the Bible tells us that a mustard seed of faith is enough. And so what do we do with that? And so maybe you're here today and that's your story. You're like, you know, I've been coming for a while. I really want to trust God, but I just feel like my faith isn't good enough, and I'm just kind of waiting to have a better faith. I'm waiting to believe better. no. You, you have, what if, if you're feeling that on you to come to Christ, that's an invitation. That, that's the Holy Spirit that God has put on you to invite you to the, to the dinner table, to invite you to eternity with him, to invite you to the party, to invite you into the kingdom. Respond to that. Don't, don't wait for something better to come along as far as like, you, you just got to try harder, believe better, have better faith. Like, that's silly. That's dumb. Take what he's given you and put it into Christ. Let him grow that. Number five, and, and this, is, this is not the most important one because uh, I think they're all important. Um, in fact, I started with preach the gospel to yourself, so I guess we could say that's probably the most important one, but don't miss this. Gospel community. Gospel community. We're getting ready to, to launch, um, you know, Pastor Kyle's heading this up in, in January, I believe, the, uh, you know, the, the growth groups or home grown, what we're calling them, but um, you get it. Uh, he, we're getting ready to launch this idea of going deeper is in community. And gospel community is crucial. Like, you got to understand something. This might step on your toes a little bit, and that's okay. Um, this isn't the whole of church. Like, this isn't it. This is a piece of it. It's a small piece, but it, it's just, like, this is just something we do once a week. And here's the thing. You're never going to get to know somebody truly just by doing this. 
Now, when the Bible says, you, you ever want to like, kind of find an argument for, you know, people say, well, I just kind of do my own thing. I don't really need church, and I don't need to um, be a part of a church. He, here's, here's what the Bible, I think, would say to that. Well, first of all, the Bible speaks clearly against that. How are you going to do the one and others in Scripture alone? Like, and here's the thing. You're never going to need to forgive somebody if you're only doing this for an hour a week. It's superficial. I mean, I, again, I, mean, I got to be careful. I'm not saying we don't go deep in little conversations while we're shaking hands. Because, of course, we can go into the depths of our souls in those 30 seconds, right? But we have to be careful that we don't just call that gospel community because it's not. We've got to be willing to go deeper. We've got to be willing to go deeper. We need to learn how to edify others and preach the gospel into their situations. Now, this is not contrary to what I've just said, so please hear me out. Don't tell people to go do the Bible. That, that can't be the extent of it. Somebody's telling you the problems. Well, just here's a verse, go do this. Tell them to go to Jesus. Jesus is the word. We may be telling people to go do the Bible without them abiding first. We assume the gospel. We need to be going deep. And we need to have these gospel conversations. We need to believe the gospel. We need to push them to believe the gospel. You can believe the gospel and not believe the gospel. Okay? What I mean by that is you, you're functionally an unbeliever every time you sin. <laughs> Think about that, right? So, so we need to be constantly reminded. I've got three people in my life, more than that really, but three main people in my life that I just go to, and they, they know the most part, for the most part, my, my junk. And uh, that's crucial. You have to have that. So I need to be reminded of the gospel. I need to be reminded. I don't have to try harder. I need to rest better. I need to believe in the gospel. Then out of that, we can obey the word. Because Jesus has already accomplished all the requirements of God for, for us and for them. So this is huge. Be vulnerable. No veneers. No facades. Find people to go deep with. Share your junk. Be open. God's already outed us at the cross. One of my favorite pastors I love to listen to says that, and I love that. But it's so true. Why do we have to pretend? We've already been outed. Isn't that what the gospel is? It's this eternal declaration of you're a bum. I, I tell my students this all the time, and, and I tell myself this all the time. You're a train wreck. Jesus loves train wrecks. That's kind of how my summation of the gospel. You're a train wreck. Jesus loves train wrecks. Uh, is a guy I like to listen to a lot. Uh, I listen to about four podcasts a week from different uh, pastors in the country, and one of which is uh, it's actually Billy Graham's grandson. His name's Tully and Chavigian. It's a fun name. Um, he's, he's uh, it's something he said uh, several weeks ago that I wrote down just for this occasion, and uh, it was good to hear, good to be reminded of, and I think it'll, it'll be good for you. Uh, if we're afraid to let people see our badness, it reveals how much we've built our identity on appearing to be good. Let's think about that. If we're afraid to let people see our badness, it reveals how much we've built our identity on appearing to be good. Christian growth is recognizing more and more my deficiency and Christ's sufficiency. Like, if you've been following Jesus, this is what I find so much hope when I hear pastors say this, because I have to hear this, because I, I, again, I'm, I'm constantly like, man, if I was really a Christian, would I have just did that, said that, thought that, been there, whatever, you know. It, and I love, I love hearing this, you know, and, and I just want to say this to you you should be seeing more and more that you're a, you're, you're a train wreck. Like, that, it's part of growth. Like, I, I think, I've, I, I, I know, I've seen more in me now that is needs redeemed than I did the day God saved me. God was just gracious, and just gracious enough not to just dump it all in my lap at that time. I would have just, I just, I don't know what I would have done. It would have been bad. But he's graciously revealing these things to us. Not to, not to lead us to destruction. He's doing it out of love. He's, he's putting that pressure on us so that we can be open about these things, so we can have those conversations, so that we can talk to people, so that we can share these things, so that we can have people come speak gospel into our lives, so we can go speak the gospel into their lives. But like, the whole point of the Christian life is, is making much of Christ and not much of ourselves and finding rest in that and finding, abide, uh, you know, finding how we abide in that. And being comfortable with that and, and loving that. And so that, yeah, you got to think about that. Are you, are you doing this well? So when I say, are you abiding well? Are you doing these things? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself? Are you, gospel, are you becoming fluent in the gospel? Are you fighting to believe that obedience is meant to leave you to joy? 
Are you reading the word from an already accepted view? And are you involved in gospel community? Well, here's the good news. If you, you hear that and you're like not doing any of those really well, maybe I'm kind of doing one of those well, repent. It's a gift of the Christian, repentance. It's where we put Jesus in his proper place. We see him for who he truly is and we get to turn away from the dumb idols. And we get to come back to him. Repent, confess. Confess it to God and maybe start today with this gospel community and find somebody that you, you feel like you can maybe trust and, and just say, hey, I just want to share this with you. Would you pray for me? I just need, maybe you could check up on me this week. Maybe we could talk. Maybe we could meet. Maybe we could meet for coffee. And I, I know you guys are, you're doing this stuff. But we got to do it more. We got to be more intentional. So basically, abide means you're invited to be vulnerable. You're invited to rest. Uh, maybe for the first time. If you're a believer, then you're called to take heart these words from Scripture. You're called to repent, and that's and all believers, okay? And we do that in resting and abiding well because we know that's already been done for us in Christ. Where we have failed at all points of this, which we all have, Christ never did in our place. And if you're not a believer, you can come to know Christ today. Like You can put your hope in Christ today because despite you, he loves you and died and rose for you. It's not because of you. It's despite you. I, love, I preach this verse. This is one of the verses I preach to myself a lot because I, I just have to. And it's, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Like, while I was still in sin, while I was running headlong this way, I wasn't trying to get my stuff together and God was like, well, he's making an effort. Let's get him in the kingdom. He's awesome. Well, that bums, he's not doing anything. We're just gonna let him go. no. I was running headlong this way. I didn't care. Okay? I didn't care. And what did he do? He started wooing me. He started softening my heart. He started bringing me to himself while I was still a sinner. What could I possibly do to make him not love me anymore? You know, we're here to talk. If anybody has any questions, just want prayer. That's what we're here for. Um, you can stand, you can sit, I don't, we're going to pray.